Hey everybody, I am here with my defense guide, long awaited. I've kind of teased it and talked about it for a while. Finally got around to doing it. Um, I didn't want to delay any further, even though I am recovering from an illness, but I just, I have the time today and I just need to get it done. So my apologies in advance. If there's a little nasal resonance, sniffling or coughing, um, we'll get through it. I don't think it's going to be too bad. I am mostly out of the woods. So just, just wanted to give some advance warning. But let's just go ahead and jump into it. Let's just start talking about making your uh, your character a beefy boy in this game. Um, who is this directed at? So just like my other video, I'm just trying to, uh, you know, give people the tools to make their own builds or to take other build guides and tweak them to their liking. Um, so if you feel like you have trouble with either one of those things uh, or you just want to you know, make sure you have the most information possible to do that, then you've come to the right place. Um, we're going to talk about calculating damage, so things like order of operations with incoming damage. We're going to talk about damage scaling, so uh, when it's efficient and when it's not. Um, we're going to talk about defensive layering, which is kind of how all the pieces of your defensive package come together um, to create, you know, particular strengths and weaknesses. And um, we're going to try to do this without getting into too much math, though we will certainly be using some mathematical examples. Sometimes it's just the best way to go, and I think it does clarify concepts uh, in some cases. But I'll try to avoid it where I think it's going to um, muddy the waters and make things more confusing. We're also going to uh, just define some terms. Um, I always want to be clear when there's a term I use a lot. I want to be consistent with it and I want to make sure people know what I'm talking about, um, you know, and how I define it uh, so that we're on the same page in this discussion. So this is the first bit of terminology, really, um, though there's a concept behind it, HP versus EHP. So in the POE community, people say EHP when they're talking about how much uh, health or life you have, how much mana and how much energy shield you have. Mana, if you um, use the uh, the stat that sort of uh, makes your mana pool an extension of your health pool, like the Mind Over Matter Keystone, or some of the other stats available that do the same thing. Um, so people will say, I have, you know, 5,000 EHP if they have 3,000 life and 2,000 energy shield. Well, that's just an incorrect use of the term. And I know that if you're, if you've been in the POE community a long time and somebody says that, you know what they mean. But I still think that as a community, we should work to change that because it's confusing in some cases when you want to bring up actual EHP and have a discussion about it because it's an important topic to discuss uh, when you are having a discussion about, uh, you know, boosting defenses on a character or the effectiveness of a particular stat or something like that. And I also think that it adds no information. If you say my character has 5,000 HP, or you say my character has 5,000 EHP, you, in either case, you don't know the distribution between life and energy shield. You would still have to um, explicitly say how much of each you have. And so it doesn't actually add any additional information, really. Um, what does EHP actually mean? EHP refers to uh, a, a sort of corrected amount of life you have that factors in mitigation. Um, so just to give you an example, to clarify that a little further, if you have a character that has a thousand life, you can take exactly 1000 damage before it dies. If you have a character that has a thousand life, but mitigates 50% of all incoming damage, that character will now take 2000 damage to die. And so the character's effective HP is 2,000 because that's how much damage the enemy has to deal before it kills you. And so you can see how this can um, more accu accurately represent the tankiness of your character. It will also make it easier to draw comparisons between different defensive options. Now, some caveats to this. There's a single hit EHP that you might want to calculate separately. Um, and what I mean is because there are chance-based uh, forms of mitigation in this game, like block, 
50% block chance means 50% of hits sneak through. So a single hit EHP only factors in things basically that apply every time. Um, because you want to know if a hit does get through, how big of a hit can I survive is essentially what you're, you're calculating there. The other tricky part about EHP is that it's only specific to the damage type and source that uh, is threatening you currently. So, you know, you don't have the same amount of EHP against a physical attack that you do against an elemental spell, for example. And so it makes it more compl complicated to make uh, an evaluation, but that's just the reality is it is complicated to make these evaluations. Um, and it's one of the reasons I really like uh, scaling defenses because it's this game of push and pull between this, the different things you need to defend against, making trade-offs all the time and that type of thing. It just makes for really interesting decision-making in my opinion. Return on investment. So with damage, the more you invest into a particular stat, the, the uh, more you suffer from diminishing returns. So the first 100% increased damage you have is very powerful. If you already have a 1000% increased damage, the next 100% you get is a lot less impactful. Well, the sort of opposite is true with defense. If you already have, let's say you have zero resist to, we'll just say fire resistance. Getting 25% fire resistance, I mean, it is very effective. 25% less damage coming in is 25% less damage coming in, but that's all it does. If, however, you're starting from 50% fire resistance, getting another 25 cuts the damage coming in in half, right? You've, you've gone from taking 50% damage to taking 25% damage, cuts it in half, relatively speaking, aka it boosts your, it doubles your EHP against that type of damage. And there is a little nuance here because you can reach a point where you're so tanky that additional investment is pointless. If you already mitigated 99.9% .9 of damage, yet technically the next 0.1% would be incredibly powerful because it would make you immortal to that type of damage, but you probably are already functionally immortal. You take so little damage that you know you, you resist it enough. And so you do, although you want to in, invest in certain defensive layers enough, that you uh, you know reap this benefit of an increased return on investment. You don't need to go so far out of your way uh, if your character is already tanky enough against whatever it protects you against. So another um, sort of concept that comes along with that that it's almost like implied by what I just said, um, but worth pointing out I think is that you generally don't want to split your investment into two different defensive layers that do the same thing. So dodge and block are basically the same. There's some nuance there, but we'll just say they're the same, right? They fully prevent attack hits. And so 30% dodge and 30% block basically boost your EHP in the same way. Well, if you had 30% dodge and 30% block, it would be worse than just having 60% dodge. And the math behind that is if you dodge 30% of hits, that means 70% of them make their way to you, right? So you're taking 0.7, uh, whatever damage times 0.7, right? You're, you're multiplying it by 70%. Well, you have to just do that again if you also have 30% block. So incoming damage times 0.7 times 0.7. So 49% of damage seeps through if you have 30 dodge and 30 block, aka you're mitigating 51% of incoming attacks. Well, it's just better to have 60% dodge, right? Because then you're mitigating 60% of incoming attacks. So this is notable because it's the opposite of how damage works, where it's better to get two 30% more multipliers than it is to get a 60% more multiplier, because 1.3 times 1.3 is just a bigger number than 1.6, right? That's that's the math behind that one. So, you know, there you just you you have to be careful about that. Though there is again a little nuance there, and I'll just say that 
um, if if one of them is a layer that can easily be negatively affected by an enemy in some way, right, debuffed or something, then maybe there's some value in having less overall mitigation, but them being less susceptible to the same kinds of debuffs and things like that. But as a general concept, you want to focus your investment on um, one defensive layer that does a particular thing rather than spreading it out across many that do the same thing. Yeah, nuance that we'll get into later. Um, layering. What is layering talking about? I think a good visual for this is imagining that you're wearing a suit of armor and in the suit of armor, there's different materials, right? Each of those materials has like a different thickness to it and resilience. And th that sort of thickness represents how much investment you've made, right? How powerful that defensive layer is. And then you have areas on that suit of armor that might be more exposed, right? So maybe the chest plate is just really reinforced. There's multiple layers, they're thick, they're heavy duty, but then the armpit, there's nothing, right? Or there's very little, there's cloth. Well, that area is a lot more vulnerable. And so the, the sort of analogy here is that those different layers in the suit of armor are kind of like the different pieces of your total defensive package, right? Your physical damage reduction, your elemental resistances, your block, et cetera, et cetera. And some of them overlap. Some of them do prevent the same kinds of damage, but um, it's, some of them are thicker than others, but there will be spots where there's very little coverage, right? There might be a particular, maybe you're susceptible to chaos damage over time, right? It's a, it's a weakness in your defensive package. Um, so the reason that it can be useful to sort of think about defenses uh, in this way is because it helps you identify areas where there is redundancy. And earlier I said redundancy isn't good. That's only if you're intentionally splitting your investment between multiple things. If you incidentally get multiple things or you've already maxed out the possible investment into one layer, but still feel like you need another layer against the same kind of um, damage source or type, then that's fine. Uh, and the reason that some redundancy can be good is because enemies debuff you, right? So they might render a defensive layer less effective. Um, there are map mods that cripple your defenses. And then there's chance-based defenses that you don't want to re rely on entirely, something like block or dodge as well. Again, the concept is useful so that you can make sure you identify areas that are weak so you can shore up those weaknesses. You can fill in the gaps so you don't fall over anytime you encounter whatever it is that you're weak against. So uh, you do have to be careful. You don't want to invest so much into something that it causes you to spread yourself thin other places. It is a balancing act where you need to make sure you reap the rewards of return on investment, like I mentioned before, but not to the point that you neglect other defenses to the point where you're still dying all the time. So, you know, it, it is a tricky give and take between the different um, types of, of defensive layers that you have. And like I said, that's why I really um, like designing the, the defensive packages on characters. So just a, a little visual um, that I think will help with the concept of defensive layering. So attack spell and damage over time are the different sources of damage. Physical, elemental, and chaos are the different damage types. And so there's physical attacks, there's elemental spells, there's elemental attacks, etc. cetera. Um, and I just took a character that had a few different defensive stats and listed them where they apply. So this particular character has a reduced damage taken stat that is just generic reduced damage taken, works against everything. Um, the character also has armor, which only works against physical attacks and spells, etc., etc. So you can use this to help identify places where you have a lot of defensive layers. And yeah, you, you still have to know how much investment you have in each one, right? Like on this character, if they only have 5% reduced damage taken, you can maybe ignore that right? Or um, just keep in mind that it's only a small amount of damage mitigation. Um, 
but it, it should help you, again, just identify places where uh, your character, you, you know, the character strengths and weaknesses, basically. Order of operations. So when uh, an enemy attacks you or uses a spell against you, um, the, the way the damage is calculated, it's, there's a particular order where things are done. So first it checks if you evade the hit, then it checks if you dodge the attack or spell, um, then any damage shifts take place. So I, I've provided an example here of what I mean. Um, you can actually make it so that incoming damage gets shifted to a different type. And uh, so any mitigation that occurs, occurs after this. Then resistances and physical reduction, then less or reduced damage taken, or increased damage taken, actually, um, and then block or spell blocks. So that's the order stuff happens. We're gonna go through each of these defensive layers in a little more detail, though. So, evasion. Uh, Used to be, I would say, criminally underrated. I think people appreciate it now more than they used to. Um, I never saw people use jade flasks. I don't know why. It's always been really powerful, um, just as an example. But anyway, I digress. Let's talk about how it works. Um, so it's capped at 95%. That is a very high cap. And that's notable because, like I mentioned earlier, the more you invest in something, the more uh, returns you get on that investment. So going from 90 to 95% chance to evade gives your character a big boost to survivability, doubles their EHP against attacks because evasion only works against attacks. It does also fully prevent the damage and it is also worth noting that you are not considered to be hit if you evade the attack. Just notable for effects that um, kick in if you've been hit recently or if you haven't been hit recently. Um, it interacts with an enemy stat, which is accuracy. So you have an evasion rating. The enemy has an accuracy rating. There is some math that is, that is done that converts that to a percent chance for the enemy to hit you, which you just subtract from 100 to uh, get your chance to avoid a hit. If they have a 75% chance to hit you, you have a 25% chance to evade that hit. Um, after those numbers are calculated, any modifiers to the enemy chance to hit, something like blind, are then applied, and then, and that will modify your chance to evade. And then finally, any modifiers to um, chance to evade, as opposed to improving evasion rating, there are things that directly affect your chance to evade, right? Like if you see something that says plus 3% chance to evade, that is then applied after um, something like blind. Um, Entropy-based system, I'm not going to go into the numbers. I listed them here for your reference, um, but I just suffice to say that the, the purpose of the entropy-based system is to avoid, uh, you know, random strings of bad luck. If it was an entirely chance-based system, even with a 95% chance to evade, I mean, statistically over enough trials every once in a while you're going to get hit like you know two three four times in a row um, the odds are low but you have you know hundreds thousands of hits coming in at you in a in a play session i mean probably many thousands and so over time the odds of a few hits seeping through one right after the other are are pretty good actually that it's just going to happen at some point and so this entropy based system smooths that out and makes it so that the the hits that seep through it's still going to be that same chance on average but it spaces them out more evenly um, so that you don't get a cluster of hits all at once if you get hit one in 20 times this system makes it so i mean yeah there's an interaction with enemy um accuracy and stuff that that may adjust this a little but it, assuming a 95 percent chance to evade uh to evade or a 5% chance to be hit, you will get hit one out of every 20 times in sequence. Unless you haven't been hit for a little while, then, then the counter kind of resets. So like the first hit is random, but then it smooths out after that, after uh, in prolonged combat scenarios. So pretty powerful. 
actually. Uh, I, I'm glad that they did this. It's a way to make it so you can have a fully evasion-based character and um, not fall over and die randomly on occasion, make them hardcore viable. Um, worth noting that there is a separate check for critical strikes. So the they need a successful hit roll to hit you. And then if they roll a successful crit, they need to actually roll uh, another successful chance to hit for that crit to take effect. So evasion is a, is a powerful defensive layer in that it also gives you um, a lot of resilience against critical strikes. I mean, you just very, if you have 95% chance to evade, you very rarely get crit, very rarely. Um, there is no interaction with damage over time, nor spells. Dodge and spell dodge. Uh, both capped at 75%, so not the same kind of ceiling as Evade here. Um, but like Evade, both of these fully prevent damage. As you might imagine, Spell Dodge, though, interacts with spells, and Dodge only interacts with attacks. Um, it is a truly random chance. There's no entropy system, so it's just a roll of the die. Um, no special interaction with critical strikes and or, or damage over time and i also as i mentioned here evasion has no special interaction it is worth mentioning because some people think there is a special synergy between dodge and evade there is not there is no special synergy the only synergy that exists is that it's it's easy to scale both in tandem um, because there's a keystone on the passive tree called acrobatics that gives you 30 percent dodge for a single point but cuts other defenses like energy shield and armor down uh it's hard to scale armor and dodge a, a really serious amount in tandem with one another because of how critical the acrobatics keystone is to getting high dodge numbers um so because there's no penalty for evasion on this keystone uh it, i mean that's the closest to a synergy that exists otherwise there is no synergy do not be confused by people saying, well, if you dodge, it resets the entropy count. They're wrong. There, there is not an interaction there. Um, somebody wants to debate me on this. I've, I've sort of debated people on Reddit about it before, multiple times, actually. Um, but it's not something that exists. Damage taken as. Uh, so I mentioned this earlier. Damage gets shifted from one uh, type to another before mitigation is calculated. It is worth noting this, this is not considered conversion. Just worth noting because it doesn't interact with stats that reference conversion and that type of thing. So just, just be aware of that. Um, because this occurs before mitigation is applied, any mitigation you have only cares about what the damage is shifted to. It is possible for it to interact with both spells and attacks. So in the case of what's listed right here, um, I'm sorry. It, it always interacts with spells and attacks. It's possible for it to interact with damage over time as well. Like the keystone shown on the screen, this is Divine Flesh, it says 50% of elemental damage taken is chaos damage. There's no specific reference to hits, unlike this item, Lightning Coil, that does specific, specifically reference hits. 30% of physical damage from hits taken as lightning damage. So just be aware that you need to look closely at the wording to know whether it has an impact on damage over time or not. It is possible to shift incoming damage to another type 100%. Uh, this is incredibly powerful. And the reason why it's incredibly powerful is because it lets you ignore certain defenses entirely. So if you remember what I said earlier when I was talking about, you know, return on investment and layering and all that kind of stuff. And I said, you don't want to go so far out of your way that you're investing in these one or two things, that everything else falls by the wayside and you have these exposed weaknesses. Well, this lets you do that. If you make it so that 100% damage or you know a large amount of damage is taken as another type, then you're making it so your heavy investment into one kind of mitigation actually influences mitigation to another type of damage, basically. Um, so, being able to ignore certain defensive stats is very, very powerful. Uh, another thing that is worth noting is that it's really strong against resistance reduction. So things like curses, uh, elemental equilibrium, etc., and penetration. B 
because again, similar to how you can neglect certain defenses, enemy debuff, debuffs just affect you less if you just don't take very much of that type of damage. If you convert 100% of all cold damage coming in, it doesn't matter if they penetrate cold damage because you don't take any cold damage. It doesn't happen. Um, so just another thing worth noting, uh, it comes up often enough and in some key fights and things that uh, that is worth noting. And while you're delving too, actually, it's a mod you can find. Elemental and Chaos Resist, these stats are probably two that most people are familiar with at some level. Um, they both are capped at 75% by default, but it is worth noting this cap can be raised. So uh, they can go up to a maximum of 90%. They both interact or they interact with uh, all types of damage of the relevant type. Attacks, spells, damage over time, doesn't matter as long as it's elemental or chaos. Um, it can be negative. Uh, so if you have negative resistance, you actually take more damage. It's kind of like giving the enemy a boost to their damage. Every negative point is like a, a more modifier for the enemy. So if you have minus 50 resist, you just take 50% more damage of whatever type it is. Um, it is also worth noting that overcapped values are relevant. So what I mean is, you know, if you have enough resistance so that you would have 100% fire resist, but it gets scaled down to 75% because that's the cap. Well, that 25% is actually not completely wasted because it interacts with certain enemy debuffs and things. And I list elemental weakness here because that's a really common um, map mod. Uh, but enemies curse you and do other things. And this gives you a little buffer against that. It doesn't work against penetration, um, but it does work against resistance reduction. Physical damage reduction. Capped at 90%, so you can really scale this one up there. Um, I'm just going to throw it out there, too. Uh, people pretend like physical damage is not a threat. The, the most damage you get in this game is physical damage. Period. You receive more physical damage than anything else. That's all there is to it. Yeah, there's some particularly scary sources of like very bursty elemental damage, but there's very bursty physical damage, too. And I think the fact that physical damage gets neglected a lot is why you often hear people say that you just get one shot in this game because they just they just think that physical damage isn't a threat, but it's wrong. Uh, a lot of very bursty damage is physical. And in fact, some of the modifiers that boost elemental damage are scaled based on physical damage. So yeah, they give the enemy extra elemental damage, but it's only scary if they already have a ton of physical damage. And so physical damage uh, reduction is very important in my mind. Um, maybe not specifically physical damage reduction in and of itself, but something that mitigates physical damage is important. Um, there's currently no way to increase this cap past 90% that I am aware of. It interacts with both spells and attacks. And armor does not interact with damage over time, but other sources of physical damage reduction that say percent physical damage reduction, like what you get from an endurance charge, does interact with damage over time. But armor only interacts with hits. Um, armor is tricky. Uh, you can look up the equation on the wiki. I was not trying to rhyme there. Um, but armor, uh, the percent that it reduces physical damage is based on the size of the hit. Essentially, the larger the hit, the lower the percent reduction to that hit. And it's worth noting that you will never prevent more from a hit than one-tenth of your armor value. So if you have 10,000 armor, you will never prevent more than 1,000 damage from an incoming hit. So armor is definitely more impactful against lots of small incoming hits because percentage-wise, it reduces um, more of them. Uh, and so you just get a bigger boost to your EHP from armor when we're talking about a lot of like small to moderate hits. However, because of the way the math is done, when your physical damage reduction on your character is calculated against hits, it aggregates 
all your percent sources, so things like endurance charges or a basalt flask or whatever, it aggregates that with your armor. So because of the sort of boost to return on investment, like I described earlier, you know, if you have 50% physical damage reduction, the next 10% you get is a lot. It's, it's double, it would be like get going from zero to 20% physical damage reduction in terms of how it affects your EHP. And so armor is pretty good against big hits if you already have things like endurance charges and other sources of physical damage reduction that aggregate with it. So I generally think you want to ignore armor if you're not mitigating physical damage through actual physical damage reduction. If you're not getting endurance charges or using a basalt flask or um, you know using the Pantheon powers that give you percent physical damage reduction, then armor is a lot less useful. Um, but if you already have all that, armor is very powerful uh, and helps a lot in tanking very, very large hits. Um, just worth noting, like I said, percent physical damage reduction, it's global, it doesn't care if it's a big or small hit, it always mitigates that percentage. So it's more effective in a sense because of sort of like the amount you can get, you know, 4% uh, less damage from a tiny hit doesn't matter that much um, unless we're aggregating it with other sources like armor um, as it does against a really large hit. So it, generally, like, it's always a good stat to have, but it's most noticeable against really big hits. Reduced or less damage taken. Um... Fortify is an example of this. Uh, Fortify used to be reduced damage taken, but now it's less damage taken, so that it doesn't stack with other sources of reduced damage taken, because it was getting out of hand when people would stack those together, again, because of the increased returns on investment, like I referenced earlier. Um, very powerful stat in a lot of cases. Sometimes it does specify, you know, reduced physical damage taken or elemental or whatever, um, so, but there are a lot of sources of reduced or less damage taken that are more generic than that. Some that work against literally all damage, like you see in some ascendancies, or like Fortify that work against, it works against all hits. Um, you know, it works against Chaos, Elemental, and Physical, as long as it's a hit. Uh, this is uncapped. You can get this to 100%, and there are some builds that have, uh, abused stacking this kind of stat. Until it does get to 100%, there have been immortal builds made um, using these kinds of stats. Um, there is a flat and a percent uh, less damage taken, or reduced damage taken. Um, the flat value uh, modifies the incoming damage first. This is notable because it makes it less effective. If the flat happened last, you could, in theory, get down to, well, you still can, uh, but you could more easily get down to zero damage hits from, from certain sources. Um, and so I just highlighted there's a particular unique here that, that has that ex an example of that like flat, uh, the flat version of the stat on it. Um, I also just wanted to mention there is a stat reduced extra damage taken from critical strikes that exists. Um, this works by whatever the bonus damage is beyond their base. So if, you know, an enemy does double damage on crits, it's it's only affecting the portion of the damage beyond the first 100%. It's only the second 100% that's being modified. So, you know, if it said 30% uh, less extra damage taken from crits, and, you know, the monster does a 100 damage hit, but if they crit, it's a 200 damage hit, you're still only taking 30% away from that bonus 100 damage that they get from critting. But it's still a pretty powerful stat and it's worth noting, I think, that this is powerful with armor um, because, as I said earlier, armor is less effective against big hits. So if you can do something to make it so there are fewer incoming big damage spikes, like from a crit, uh, then it makes armor more powerful. Very, very useful stat in hardcore as well. Um, you know, you just you don't want to get one shot. It's very hard to prevent that. Block and spell block. 
very similar to Dodge. The slide looks super duper similar. Um, and that's because it works basically the same. 75% cap prevents all incoming damage. Block applies to hit uh, attacks. Spell block applies to spells. Truly random chance, no interaction with damage over time. The one thing worth mentioning is that if you block a hit, you still got hit. Again, with reference to any you know buffs or effects that say if you've been hit recently or haven't been hit recently and things like that. Um, if you dodge, you are not hit. You are not considered to be hit. Energy shield. Um, this is just another source of HP. Uh, so technically not mitigation and, and wasn't listed on that order of operations because all that calculates what gets through to the energy shield after the fact. Um, but some things worth noting. Damage goes to energy shield before life, unless it's chaos damage. Chaos damage sneaks past your energy shield and always hits your life pool. Now, technically this is true, but most of the time, if people use energy shield, they either use the chaos inoculation keystone, which gives you immunity, it sets your life at one, but it makes you immune to chaos damage. So it prevents uh, you know, this kind of unique interaction with ES. Um, and then there's also this unique Chevron's wrappings, which makes it so chaos damage does not bypass energy shield. I don't like going into all these nuances too much, except I think it's worth noting just because of how, how many builds use these mechanics. It's a huge number of them. Though hybrid is kind of making a comeback. There's become better support for it. Um, but Nonetheless, worth noting that it is very often that people use uh, one of these two ways of avoiding that downside. My cat's coming to say hi uh, while recording this. So also worth noting that you have a 50% chance to avoid stun if you have any energy shield on your character at all. Um, the other thing worth noting is that it does recharge at a rate of 20% of maximum energy shield per second if you don't take any damage for a couple of seconds and there are ways to modify the stat so it kicks in faster um, and there's also ways to make it so that it continues happening uh, even if you do start to take damage. So very, very powerful built-in sort of recovery for energy shield into the mechanic. <laughs> my, my cat's going to make it hard for me to read the slides. <laughs> oh, kitty. Um, so damage taken from mana before life. So this is um, mostly obtained by getting the Mind Over Matter Keystone. It's on your tree. It's also accessible from um, this unique item here that I'm showing. But I also show this item because it's a stat that you can get uh, outside of Mind Over Matter. Additionally, this stat does stack with Mind Over Matter. So Mind Over Matter makes it so 30% of damage is taken from mana before life. Well, this says 10% of damage taken from mana before life, so that just gets added on top of that, and now 40% of damage is taken from mana before life. Um, it does interact with all damage, damage over time, physical, chaos, whatever. All sources are additive, as I said, and it's also worth noting that mana inherently generates regenerates 1.8% of maximum per second, and this does get boosted from percent increases to mana regen. So if you had a 100% increased mana regen, you'd get another 1.8% max per second. So this is worth noting because it's a lot easier to scale mana regeneration and mana recovery. And it's one of the reasons this is kind of a powerful defensive layer or a powerful way to boost uh, your HP pool because it's a portion of your HP pool that recovers very rapidly, or at least it's it's um, not difficult to get it to a point where it is recovering very rapidly. So pretty powerful, pretty powerful. Um, also worth noting actually that with Mind Over Matter, if something does some kind of percent based damage, so if it does, you know, 10% of your max HP per second, it's actually, you're, you're kind of cheating with Mind Over Matter because your HP pool is big, right? Because you're 
mana is an extension of your life pool, um, and those percent effects are only affecting uh, the, the damage they deal based on the portion of your HP pool that is life. So, for example, Mind Over Matter is really good against lab traps, just as an example. Um, guard skills. So, these were introduced, boy, I think in Legion or something like that, League, several, it's a couple of years ago now, it's weird that it's been that long. Um, but I want to talk about these because basically every build can take advantage of some kind of guard skill, and probably should. Um... So things worth noting, they do share a cooldown. So the different guard skills all share a cooldown. So you can't just stack five guard skills together and uh, you know use them when one's on cooldown, use the other. It doesn't work like that. Um, when For the ones that are shields, some of them are not shields, but they're buffs. Um, but the ones that are shields, they're no longer considered to be active or you're no longer under their effects once they're broken. They're instant cast. Very worth noting because you can do it in response to a slam. It doesn't interrupt your casting or attacking animations, etc. Um, and they can be triggered. So something like cast when damage taken or cast when stunned can be used with them. Um, and they also can be modified by duration and cooldown. So you can improve the uptime of these by making them last longer or come off cooldown more quickly. So Molten Shell. So this is the longest wall of text here for these, I think. Um, I'll go into the details of this guy. It's a really powerful guard skill. I use it a lot. Only interacts with hits. It gives you a shield where 75% of the damage is applied to Molten Shell before life or energy shield. Scales with armor and gem level. So uh, it gives you a shield based on the amount of armor you currently have. But it also, with gem level, the, the reason I say it scales with that is because each gem level, you get a boost to your base armor. So it doesn't scale the, the percentage of armor that it's basing the shield off of, but it gives you more armor. Um, and therefore, the shield becomes bigger. It's pretty effective at low level, just because if you already have a ton of base armor and you don't really need the armor from this. Like if you're a champion or you're a juggernaut, they can get these huge boosts to base armor. Um, then at low level, you still get a big shield. Uh, and that's kind of, it's relevant for pairing it up with like cast went damage taken, most notably. Um, it's pretty ineffective if you don't have a lot of armor. One thing worth noting is that a lot of times a granite flask and just like a little bit of percent armor or like the granite flask having the uh, iron skin um, modifier on it is enough to make it pretty decent in most cases. It's got the highest cooldown and base duration of all the guard skills. So four second cooldown, three second duration. Um, and it's the only guard skill that I'm aware of with a veil version. I don't, I'm pretty sure that's true. Um, so the Veil version gives you less flat armor, but a, a big more modifier to your armor. It, it's a lower percent of damage that gets applied to life and energy shield first. So it's actually less effective against like a one shot, um, but it's a huge shield and it lasts a lot longer. So prolonged fights like in a breach or like an ultimatum or something like that, um, it just gives you a huge, huge boost to uh, to your HP pool, basically. Since it's a shield, it kind of just extends your HP pool. And the fact that you get mitigation from the additional armor is, is relevant, too. Uh, Steel Skin only interacts with hits. Similar to Molten Shell, it's a shield where 70% of the damage is applied to Steel Skin before life or ES. It scales purely with gem level. So um, it's kind of like a spell where the, the base value, and there's nothing I'm aware of currently that modifies it from the base, um, uh, just goes up with gem level. So like a level 1 Steel Skin will do nothing for a level 90 character. You'll get you know a 40 damage shield or whatever it is. Uh, short duration and shorter cooldown than with uh, Molten Shell. So not as good uptime, but 
uh, does work pretty well because it's got a low cooldown. It works pretty well with cast when damage taken, um, assuming that you know you can you can use like a high level uh, version of the gem with your setup. Arcane cloak, so similar to the last two. It's also a shield. Seventy five percent of damage applied to it first. Again, only interacts with hits, not damage over time. Um, scales with both gem level and the current amount of mana you have. It gobbles up some portion of your mana to give you a shield. Um, also, just like Molten Shell has a, a longer cooldown and duration. And it's also worth noting that it gives you a damage boost while it's active. So until the shield has been broken, you get uh, a flat lightning damage boost. I believe to both spells and attacks, if I'm not mistaken. So this one, you're going to need... Um, you need mana in order for this to be effective, right? So, so far with Molten Shell, it sucks if you don't have armor. Arcane Cloak sucks if you don't have a bunch of mana. Uh, and Steel Skin sucks if you can't put any levels into it. You don't have the stat requirements or whatever it is. And then uh, we have Immortal Call. I don't think there's another one. Yeah. So uh, the final one is Immortal Call. It's the only one that interacts with damage over time, but it doesn't interact with chaos damage. It's only physical and elemental damage uh, that are impacted. Um, it's most effective against physical damage because you get an additional boost to uh, physical damage mitigation um, based on how many endurance charges you have at the time that you cast it. When you cast it, it consumes your current endurance charges. It gobbles them up, they go away, but then you get this big temporary um, buff against... Um, uh, physical damage. It's also worth noting that this is not a shield. It is a um, boost to mitigation. So it's a, a less damage taken modifier. Um, very short duration and pretty short cooldown. It's also scalable on the gem. Uh, the duration that is is also scalable on the gem. Um, uh, what I mean that's maybe a poor way to phrase it. It has inherent duration scaling is a better way to put that. And it scales based on um, how many endurance charges you consume. And so I list the different uh, modifiers that get boosted by consuming endurance charges. Um, it's still okay even if you don't use endurance charges, though it definitely gets better if you have some way of generating endurance charges to be consumed. Um, but it's it's not the worst if you don't have them. Um, but definitely scales the best. So it's probably the best one to use if you don't have the stat requirements for steel skin, don't have mana, don't have armor, just have like nothing that interacts with these in any special way. Immortal Call is probably the best choice. And it is still pretty effective at low level as well. Very, very powerful. Highly recommend you use a guard skill. Um, most people I would say trigger them. I actually really like just manually casting them, at least when I use Molten Shell, because of how long the duration is. You're only hitting the button once every 10 seconds or so um, to recast it. You know, you have a six or seven second long shield and a couple of seconds down. So it's, you know, eight seconds maybe. Um, but you have really good uptime and you have better control over it. So you can really make sure that you prevent yourself from getting burst down at the beginning. But lots of people like the instant cast, uh, you know, put it on left click or uh, the trigger cast. Um, but I would say experiment for yourself and, and see what your preference is. Now we're going to talk about recovery. So just, just sort of a general thing to mention with recovery. I mean, re what recovery does is it, it boosts, it extends your HP pool. If you don't get instantly killed, if you don't get one shot, then recovery has a chance to do something and basically give you additional HP. And so um, in a way, it's kind of weird to say this and uh, I don't want people to misinterpret this, but having a lot of recovery makes having more HP uh, less useful. Uh, what I mean is that if you can survive a one shot, if you have enough HP to survive a one shot, then you're gonna get so much more HP out of having recovery than you are from just trying to stack up a bunch of HP that can exist in, you know, the maximum pool 
hit pool at any any one time. Um, so just worth mentioning, it's it's very very uh, powerful. If you have enough defenses to prevent getting one shot, then it can prolong your time to kill to infinity. Um, if you get enough recovery, right? If you can just out recover any damage coming in, your time to kill is infinite. You will never die. Also worth noting that you can sort of consider recovery a defensive layer against damage over time. Um, it, it makes a very noticeable difference, though still you probably want actual mitigation against damage over time too. So I'm gonna talk about Leech here. I'm gonna try and do this in a way and just give a quick summary that this isn't an hour long discussion in and of itself because Leech is super complicated in this game. Um, and there's more in-depth like Leech guides out there but it's so powerful that I just I feel like I just have to touch on it a little bit more than in passing. Um, so Leech is made of instances. Anytime you hit an enemy, it creates a Leech instance. While that instance is active, the default is that with life, it will restore 2% uh, max life per second, and it will go until it restores 10% total life, lasting thus 5 seconds. Um, and that's just a maximum. Um, so, you know, if you could in theory uh, be restoring at a, at a rate higher or lower than that, depending on what stats you have, and it could last longer depending on what stats you have. But these are kind of the base values. Um, the total, these instances can stack and they'll always be active, but the amount that you're leeching back is capped at a maximum of 20% for life and 10% for ES, because there is ES leech as well, um, for all instances combined at any given time. That's the most you can be uh, leeching. Um, as soon as you hit full life, all instances of leech are immediately removed. And so it's kind of weird because if you attack or cast really, really slowly, um, then, you know, you need to take damage before a leech does anything, and it's hard to accumulate enough instances of leech for it to have a really, really noticeable impact. Um, if you attack or cast very quickly, then you can actually stack them up for it to be noticeable. There is, however, something called overleech that exists. There's a keystone that supports it. There's a couple of unique items. There's the Slayer Ascendancy, and that, that removes this effect where Leech goes away at full life. It stays and kind of basically turns into regen. Um, not exactly, it's still technically Leech, but from a functional standpoint, it then operates much like regen, except the, this whole instance shenaniganery. Um, finally, there are these few stats you can get that modify Leech. There's something called Increased Maximum Recovery per Leech. It increases the total amount recovered per instance, but not the rate that you recover it. Uh, increased total recovery speed per second from leech increases the, the rate of recovery per instance, but not that sum total cap of 20%, right? And it also does not decrease the, leech, the, the um, duration of a leech instance. I looked around a long time to confirm this, and I'm pretty sure that I did confirm it. Um, I believe it was actually a mark from GGG post that I confirmed it with. Um, but I mean, you can you can look around a little further. But I spent quite a bit of time to confirm that this is true. So um, increased maximum total recovery per second from from leech increases the aggregate cap of all instances, but not the amount per instance, or not the rate per instance. So essentially. That, that top one there, increased maximum recovery per leech, that is good to, um, to make it so that the duration of your leeching lasts longer, right? So Slayer gets this effect and basically makes it so that your leeching can last for 10 seconds before, go before it's all gobbled up, um, which is really, really nice. So you only need to connect hits once every 10 seconds, um, assuming that you do a big enough hit to ensure that all the bonuses you get while leeching are maintained. Increased total recovery per second from, from leech 
uh, basically reduces the number of hits it takes to get up to the aggregate cap of all the instances, right? So if you have 100% increased total recovery per second from Leech, instead of getting 2% per second from an instance, you'll get 4% uh, per second from instance, which means you only need five instances to be capped out at that 20% um, aggregate, as opposed to naturally you need to hit the enemy 10 times before you'd reach that cap, right? So getting a few hundred percent uh, increased total recovery per second from Leech, very, very powerful on slow hitting builds. You can get away with only hitting them a couple times to get to that cap if you invest enough in this. And then the one at the bottom, again, increases that cap, so uh, makes it so just the, the sort of ceiling for the effectiveness of Leech is raised. So again, maximum recovery per Leech increases the duration Total recovery per second from leech uh, increases the rate at which you ramp up to max leech. And then increased maximum total recovery increases that cap. All right, that's the, that's the quick summary of what those stats do. Um, if you take nothing else away from leech, that's what those stats do if you see them. So you can decide whether or not that matters for you. But leech is very powerful. If you can get it, you should. Regeneration is always active. Uh, there are both flat and percent sources. The percent sources are converted to a flat value and then aggregated with the flat sources. There is no maximum that I am aware of. Um, I just mentioned that Enduring Cry is busted. You get a bunch of um, what is basically life regeneration. They might technically phrase it differently, um, but I just threw it in here because it's basically regen. Um, and it's, you know, a temporary massive surge, um, but it's on command and you can even make it instant. It's very powerful. If you can squeeze it into your build, very powerful. Um, ES regeneration functions the same. If you have something that provides ES re regeneration or converts your life regen to ES regen, um, it basically works the same. Uh, and then just, I kind of referenced this earlier, but just mana regen is much easier to scale if you are using mind over matter or the damage taken from mana before life stat. Um, it's easier to scale uh, regeneration of mana than it is life. I mean, to get huge numbers. You can get a lot of life regen too, though. Don't worry about it. Um, flasks are worth mentioning too. Uh, you know, specifically life flasks. We're going to talk about utility flasks here in a second. Um, but they have different durations and amounts recovered. So if it's a shorter duration flask, it means the rate of recovery is higher. So if you're using flasks where some amount of the recovery is instant, it's really good to have the flasks that have longer durations, but also larger total amounts recovered because you're basically ignoring the duration part, right? Because you're converting it to instant leech, or excuse me, instant recovery, you don't care that it happens slowly over a long duration because you've changed it to be instant. So you just want the bigger total amount. But if you do use a flask, like I like catalyzing flasks a lot, the ones that do 50% um, increased uh, recovery rate for the flask. If you use those, you might want to sacrifice a little of the total amount recovered to get the faster recovery rate, excuse me. Um, just like Leech, flask effect goes away uh, when you reach maximum life. So if you have any kind of um, immunity or something like that on a life flask, that's gone as soon as you hit full life. Um, also just be aware that there is a way to boost this. There is something called flask life recovery rate. And also just be aware I just threw this in here at the end, that for any of these sources of recovery, there's something called increased life recovery rate that basically affects all of them. It's like a big global boost to um, life recovery, and it's very powerful. So uh, worth noting if your character, if they're part of their defensive package is just having a huge amount of recovery, something like a chieftain, a slayer, um, you know, that gains access to these these cool um, recovery mechanics, then uh, life recovery rate is an absolutely uh, critical stat to making them as tanky as possible. 
Utility flasks. Um, the flask effect will always last the entire duration. There's nothing that happens when you reach full life or anything that will cut the effect off early. The only thing that'll cut it off early is if you just use it again, it overwrites your existing flask. Um, there are a ton of great utility flasks that are powerful defensively. The granite that gives you base armor, the jade that gives you base evasion, um, stib knights that give you percent evasion and a blind uh, smoke cloud around you. Um, the one that drops uh, Consecrated Ground that gives you a bunch of regen. I mean, a Quicksilver Flask even, I mean, movement speed is, is pretty useful defensively. So very, very powerful. And there's also increased Flask effect to boost those effects further. Um, they're also a great source of immunity and buffs. So if you, you know, during mapping um, and anything outside of bossing pretty much, You'll have very good uptime on, you know, bleed immunity or freeze immunity or whatever it is, curse immunity um, from your flask. So an excellent way to get immunities. Very, very often this is neglected. Do not neglect defenses through your flasks. It is a great way to massively boost the uh, survivability of your character. And then just to mention, take a close look at unique flasks. There's a ton of them. Some of them have pretty powerful effects. I list a few of them here, Taste of Hate, Rumi's Concoction, um, that are staples on hardcore. Taste of Hate uses the damage taken as stat, so a great way to, to mitigate some physical damage by converting it to cold. Um, and uh, Rumi's Concoction, great for block builds, Forbidden Taste, something that will instantly heal your full life pool, um, etc. Very powerful. Uh, auras and reservation skills. So there's a ton of different skills that reserve mana um, by default or life if you use blood magic. Um, they give a very wide range of defensive effects and you can stack any number of them. It's only limited by, you know, your your mana pool basically and the sort of, uh, most of them are reserve a percent of your mana pool, but, the, but you can modify um, how much is reserved. So essentially what I'm saying is, is you, you, there are ways to make it so you can use more auras um, or reservation skills. Um, the effects do work on allies, so just worth noting if you, if you play in parties, it's very common for there to be some people that focus all of their uh, character investment into just getting a bunch of buffs that they carry around for the party or debuffs for enemies, whatever. Um, and it's also really good for summoners because it buff, buffs your uh, minions as well. Can be improved by percent increased aura effect. Definitely worth mentioning because there are some builds that abuse the hell out of the stat. Um, if you have 15 different auras or whatever it is on your character, percent increased aura effect becomes a highly valuable stat. It's all of a sudden giving you cold res, fire res, um, lightning res, armor, evasion, energy shield, whatever. You get what I'm saying. Uh, it gives you so many different stats. So very, very powerful. And it's also worth noting that there are some things that are considered auras, if you happen to do this, that intuitively don't really sound like auras, but in the game are considered auras. Uh, and I, the smite skill is just an example of that. It gives you like a, a buff to lightning damage that is considered an aura. Um, and it's not limited to skill-based auras. There are things like, you know, aspect of the crab or aspect of the spider that are also um, potentially considered auras. Uh, keystones. So this is a topic I could ramble on about for a really long time because there's a lot of them. There are just a ton of keystones out there um, and a lot of them have really cool and interesting effects. The defensive keystones in this game are, are just, they're just neat. They're cool. I, at least I really like them. Um, and so I just kind of have to give a little generic overall. Just be aware that they're there. Take a look at the keystones in the area on the tree that you're going for your build and see if any of them can be useful to you. Um, there are an extremely wide range of defensive effects, armor evasion, mitigation, recovery, all kinds of stuff, um, damage shifting, etc. cetera. Um, they do typically involve some kind of trade-off. Just as a quick example, Vol Pact makes it so that you double the, um, that like aggregate sort of total cap for all your leech instances, but you can't regen. Um, so stuff like that. Um, 
there are keystones that are that can be found on both cluster jewels and on timeless jewels so just be aware of those because some of them are defensively powerful especially on the timeless jewels there's some very powerful ones um again i could ramble on about this for a long time just please take a look at the keystones available to you the defensive ones make sure that you're you're not passing up on some serious power there. Um, the Pantheon. I think that the Pantheon is is criminally underrated. Um, there are a lot of stats on there that are kind of hard to get. So like percent physical damage reduction can be a little bit tough to get. And um, there's pretty decent sources of percent physical damage reduction on the Pantheon. There's movement speed. There's life recovery rate. And then there's even some kind of unique stats, like the one where if you get crit, you can't get a uh, crit again for another four seconds. That just prevents you from getting, you know, chain crit to death out of nowhere. Um, the for summoner is the one that makes you immune to chain, so effects don't chain between you and your minions. I mean, there's just a lot of really unique effects on there. Um, and the other cool thing about them is it's pretty easy to adjust on the fly. So if you want to switch a Pantheon power to deal with a particular boss or uh you know pantheon power just sort of in general while you're mapping or whatever while you're delving maybe there's another pantheon uh, set of pantheons you want to use um, but the point is that you shouldn't just dismiss them people poo poo them i think in part because they don't understand defensive scaling in this game um and i don't know there are some there's some powerful effects take a look General utility. So I crammed a lot on here because there's, there is a lot of stuff that doesn't directly mitigate damage, but helps you live, right? That, and that's what this is here. So this is the kind of stuff that's very difficult to factor into something like EHP and you just have to feel out a build. Um, but some of it's really important. Phasing is such a great defensive layer, especially if you're like a melee character um, or get into melee range with your character. I mean, just it prevents you from clipping on enemies. So uh, running into a pack of enemies and then getting flustered because all of a sudden you're unable to run through them. You can't use your movement skill because it would, you know, stick you on an enemy. And the enemy's like blocking the place where you would end up at the end of your movement skill. So then it fails and then you panic. And I've definitely died that way. So phasing just makes you just run right through packs of enemies like nothing very very powerful movement speed i mean you just manually dodge stuff better it is what it is you can outrun you can kite things if stuff gets out of hand um you're less likely to get hit by uh you know spells that are skill shot type effects all that kind of stuff um there's a ton of immunities out there immunities to ailments freeze and chill is a big one all kinds of stuff um, there's tons of uh, debuffs and status effects, things like Corrupting Blood or um, Stun, you know, that, that are extremely deadly. You can definitely get stun locked and die. Um, there are ground effects out there. They tend to be less threatening, but sometimes they're not. You know, there's ground effects in certain boss fights that are really scary. Um, it's, it's, there's some burning ground that's very, very scary uh, that just does a ton of damage, so... You know, having immunities to those things is nice. Maybe not worth going out of your way to get, um, but is nice. Um, as far as the ailments go, too, I mean, I generally like to try to make myself ailment, uh, elemental ailment immune because shock is terrifying and freeze is terrifying. Um, and I like to play hardcore. And so you are going to die from those things sometimes if you just, if you don't have immunity. And it's better to have full up time than temporary flask immunity, but works pretty well most of the time if that's if that's what you're relying on um just be aware that partial immunities become functionally true at 100 percent. so if you get 100 percent reduced effect of or chance to avoid some ailment um then it's basically the same as being immune there is some technical differences between the two but in terms of its threat to your character dying it's it's basically the same um Crowd control and debuffs on enemies is a good defensive layer. Stunning enemies, freezing enemies, uh, chilling enemies, all that kind of stuff. Very, very powerful. Corpse removal, 
Uh, there are a lot of on-death effects in the game, some of which get canceled out by corpse removal. So the, the porcupine enemy is sort of a classic example of that. And then there's a lot of temporary buffs in this game. So things like Focus, they can give you defensive boosts, or um, Dread Banner, which gives you a big boost of Fortify. Um, things like that, those temporary boosts, some of them are very powerful. Um, there's a couple of Focus mods that are, that are quite popular in Hardcore, one of which I think also boosts the effectiveness of Fortify. So just keep in mind what kind of threats uh, you know, this type of utility can help your character deal with. Um, but realistically, you're probably going to want some combination of some of these things. I get a lot of the things on this list, typically on my characters. I usually am getting phasing, significant movement speed, I'm getting some kind of CC for enemies, um, you know, I'm getting some kind of temporary buff, I'm getting ailment uh, immunities, I'm getting some immunities to some of these status effects. I mean, a, a lot of the things on this list I typically get. Damage. Yep, that's right. Do the deeps. It does help you survive. So yet another bit of push and pull you have that has to go on with um, making your character survivable is dealing enough damage because you'll just get overwhelmed it, or you'll you'll have to deal with a boss fight that has sort of like soft and rage timers where more and more the ground is covered in these degens and uh, you know, the, the boss does more damage in their last phase or whatever. And so dealing more damage helps you live. It helps you avoid those situations or it gets you out of them more quickly. Um, so just be aware that you can't just throw every point in defense. You could say, oh, I'm fine playing slow. I don't mind. Yeah, well, you're going to die more. Like you, <laughs> it, unless, unless you're getting to the point where you're making your character immune, okay, then you have an argument to be made there because it's as safe as you can possibly be. Um, but most of the time, you know, you, you wouldn't want to sacrifice 70% more damage for 10% more life. Like that would just be a terrible trade-off. You will die more that way. Um, so you just need to be careful and uh, make sure that you are uh, dealing enough damage to keep yourself safe. The other thing is that stuff like potion uptime um, and and uh, you know all those on kill effects and stuff like that. You keep all those different buffs and stuff up better if you can just womp a pack and move on to the next when you're mapping. Um, and things like stun and freeze and ailments, you know, they're more effective if you hit harder. And so uh, there, there actually is even a little bit of defensive utility directly in um, in dealing additional damage. So. Yeah, we got all the way through all that just to tell you you should deal more deeps to be defensive. Now, but it's it's a balance. It's a balance. Um, I'm just memeing a little bit. So we're finally to the end here. But I just want to kind of conclude here by saying that um, building defense is a little bit of an art. And, you know, building characters in general, there's an art to it. Um, but I think defense in particular, because of the different things that I said and how difficult it is, to objectively evaluate, uh, I, I think there's more of an art to it than there is with scaling damage. Um, the the path of building numbers you get, uh, you know, they're a decent representation of your character's damage. Yeah, there's stuff like damage up time. Um, yeah, there's stuff like what buffs are up and what buffs aren't up to boost your damage at any given time. Whatever, whatever. But it's still easier to evaluate than it is with defense because you have all these different ways of measuring how powerful your defenses are and you have a lot of different utility uh, effects and um, immunities and debuffs you want to avoid and all that kind of stuff. And you just got to strike the right balance, right? You want to invest heavily into things um, and have you know a wide net cast so you cover all your bases, but that you're really beefy against at least some um, some types of enemies. You know, you need some redundancy, but you also need to get enough HP. I, I kind of spent most of this time not talking about HP too much because it's just obvious if you get more HP yeah, that, that it boosts your survivability. I think everybody knows that. I don't think I really need to explain that. Um, but I just want to come circle back around and say, you know, you don't want to ignore HP to invest in all these other cool things that I'm talking about here 
you, you need to have the right balance between HP and mitigation because a 1,000 HP pool with a ton of mitigation is probably not as good as a 5,000 HP pool with, with modest mitigation, right? Because going from 1,000 to 5,000 still boosted your EHP potentially by five-fold if all mitigation was kept the same. So if you lost half your mitigation, but you boosted your HP by five-fold, then your, or your EHP is going to be two and a half times as high. Um, don't worry about the numbers there too much, but the, the point is that you got to balance the mitigation with the HP. Um, as I said before, don't neglect defensive layers. Um, and we're doing a little summary here, but don't neglect defensive layers um, in an attempt to, you know, take advantage of those, that sweet return on investment from um, boosting up certain defenses. Um, Recognizing what utility your character needs, very, very important. Some of that utility stuff is just as, or if not more important than some of those like mitigation um, layers of defense I was talking about earlier. Um, knowing what content you wanna tackle is important. If you wanna do super deep delving without dying, if you know you wanna hit level 100, are you okay with dying on occasion? Um, do you just never want to die at all? Are you playing hardcore? Are there certain bosses you want to fight? I mean, all this stuff feeds into um, what you want out of your defensive package. Um, temporary steroids are key, but you, of course, have to make sure you're not relying on them too much. You need your character to be resilient enough to survive most things and then temporary steroids available when stuff gets hairy or there's a particularly big boss attack or something you just want to face tank. Um, so make sure that you use temporary steroids. They're really strong, but make sure that your character isn't relying on them at all times. Again, getting enough damage, right? Make sure you haven't invested so much in defense that you hit like a wet noodle. And then there's the theory versus practice. Uh, you know, when balancing all these things out, sometimes it's even if you're sitting there looking at EHP values and stuff, because path building actually provides those now, um, it's hard to determine exactly how it's going to feel on your character um, and really know how those changes are going to manifest. You just you just got to try it sometimes. Just get out there and just start slaying monsters and see if you feel like a boss or not, and if you feel beefy. Um, so, I don't know. As you can see, I get into this. I think it's pretty cool. And... Uh, you know, just just don't don't lose sight of the fact that you need to just get out there and try this stuff and just see how it feels. Because the more you do it, the more you just you can kind of almost through intuition or experience um, get a sense for uh, you know what needs to be adjusted, and um, and that's a that's a pretty cool thing. As much as all this presentation is helpful, you still need to get get out there and put it in practice. So anyway, I've been rambling on for almost 80 minutes now. Um, hopefully this has been helpful for you. Uh, you know, if you have questions, feel free to throw me comments in YouTube. I still do stream once in a while, but it's kind of few and far between now. But if you catch me in a stream, throw any questions my way you want. I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to engage and interact. Um, but yeah, get out there and, you know, make your characters beefier than ever. Thanks, everybody.